So, uh, uh, sepsis, when we look at it, there is acute damage. Yeah. Can you hear me, Em? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, there is acute damage and the destruction of matrix and cartilage occurs within uh, hours and days. So, this is definitely an emergency. Uh, when we consider tuberculosis, which is ubiquitous in our environment, it is more gradual and progressive and both sides of the joint uh, seem to be involved. So bacterial septic arthritis is often, the diagnosis is delayed. This is an orthopedic emergency, which uh, is usually a clinical diagnosis supplemented by a elevated ESR and it should not be delayed. And it's common in less than six months old Premature people, staph aureus is the most common cause. A coexisting osteomyelitis can lead to uh, septic arthritis in joints that are intracapsular. So from birth to 18 months, we know there are transphysial vessels that can take an osteomyelitis up into the joint and spread to the cartilage causing joint destruction. About one and a half years of age, the physis becomes a barrier to this. So when we look at the femur, we know there are uh, three main growing centers around the proximal femur, one on the head, which we call the capital epiphysis. The other is around the neck and the third is around the greater trochanter. And knowledge of this is very important along with knowledge of the acetabular growth plates uh, to address uh, these issues related to variable uh, growth plate damage in these uh, children. So damage can be due to damage to blood supply, tamponade, or inflammation. Direct, direct effects are seen on the joint surface. The head might be damaged or completely destroyed. And indirect effects of avascular necrosis due to blood, blood supply damage causes secondary arthritis. The damage to the physis can cause growth disturbances, depending on where the damage is located, medial or lateral. So you can see a seemingly normal joint just dramatically destroys itself. Coming to hip sepsis that is neglected, that presents late, uh, I think the most important thing is to create a problem list. Why is this particular child presenting to us? Not on the x-ray first, but on the symptoms. Does he have pain? Does he have stiffness of the joint? Is there a deformity? Is there instability? Is there a limb length inequality? or is there abductor insufficiency? So this will be our problem list. And based on this, uh, there are various classifications. The four common ones are Hanka, Choi, Forlin, and Johari. Uh, I will not go into the details of the Hanka and the Choi classification. All of Both of these classifications deal around variable damage to the capital femoral epiphysis, uh, pseudarthrosis of the femoral neck, uh, causing a post-infective non-union, uh, presence or absence of dislocation. The one that is very useful is the Forlin classification. It is very simple. There are four types. And we look at stability of the hip and presence or absence of the head neck. So a type one would be a reduced hip, 1A. A type 1B would be a reduced hip without the head. A type 2A would be a normal hip that is dislocated. Type 2B would be a hip that has destroyed his head and is also dislocated. So depending on this, we choose our uh, treatment menu. So imaging is useful. Radiographs are very, very useful. But in growing children, we have to look at the cartilage. So arthrography is very useful. A CT or MRI might be important to differentiate capital epiphysis damage or delayed ossification from destruction of the physis like this. So when you do an arthrogram, uh, if you think there is no head, you might see that there is a cartilage and large of the head. And this information becomes very, very important to us while uh, doing treatment. And similarly, advanced imaging can be used. Uh, DDH is a fairly common pathology that we see, and it's very important to differentiate a DDH from a sepsis. And I think the most important thing is first to get two views, an AP and a lateral view, and then look at the presence or absence of the capital femoral epiphysis. In DDH, the epiphysis is small, but it's usually not absent. Whereas in sepsis, the epiphysis is destroyed very rapidly. So get two views and then look at the presence or absence of the epiphysis. 
This is the treatment menu based on the problem list we presented. There are various treatments and we are going to go and delve into each one of these and the indications of each one as we move along the talk. So 1A is a hip that is reduced in its position and the femoral head is intact. For treatment options for this is observation. You want to do a femoral osteotomy or a pelvic osteotomy. So when we look at this kind of hip, you see how it is rapidly, uh, seemingly normal X-ray left alone, the hip destroys rapidly. So this kind of a hip, you can do a shelf uh, coverage of the femoral head or a greater trochanter apophysiodesis in young children or a transfer in older children to improve the abductor lever arm. This is a 14 year old boy who has coxa vara. So if the head is preserved and located, uh, there is a neck non-union or a pseudarthrosis of the neck, uh, we can do a valgus osteotomy. Usually when we are doing the valgus osteotomy, we can take a little bit of bone graft and put it at the non-union site without really doing a lot of dissection there. And you can get very predictable healing in a valgus position. So this is a very a useful and powerful technique to address a femoral neck non-union. So this is an example from our own practice, a femoral neck non-union post-infective, which presented late. Uh, you can see in the CRM pictures that there is a uh, complete discontinuity of the neck. And we went ahead and did a valgus osteotomy and some bone grafting of the non-union site and it healed quite well. And you can also get some uh, length gain of the lower extremity by doing this. So treatment options for a 2A. A 2A is a hip where the hip, uh, the head is present, but the hip is dislocated. An arthrogram or MRI might be helpful to define if the femoral head is present in young children. So here we have to discuss close versus open reduction plus minus uh, uh, other procedures. And I'm not going to go into the detail of this algorithm proposed by Dr. Johari, but uh, in a nutshell, it is, do you want to treat this closed or do you want to treat it open? An indication for open relocation is failure of closed relocation and presence of significant subluxation or acetabular dysplasia. Factors associated with poor results following open relocation, if there is preoperative hip stiffness, avascular necrosis, premature fusion of the triradiate cartilage, or thinning of cartilage on MRI, or intraoperatively there is a femoral head flattening, there is large head, coxa magna, cartilage erosions, or marked fibrosis and adhesions, these are all uh, factors that are associated with poor prognosis. So for a 1B, 1B is a hip that is in its station, but the head has disappeared. Head absent on x-rays, but there is no dislocation. Treatment depends on morphology. We need advanced imaging or direct inspection to see whether the head is present or not. So if the CFE is destroyed in skeletally immature patients, there is remodeling potential for six to eight years. We can place the apophyseal greater, uh, greater trochanter cartilage into the acetabulum, a procedure called trochanteric arthroplasty. And you can get some sort of a remodeling of this into a pseudo hip. So you can see the series of x-rays here. This is not our own case. It is from one of the papers. Uh, it is sometimes very difficult to believe that this kind of remodeling can take place. And this is one of our own cases, a four-lin uh, 1B, where the acetabulum, uh, the head was destroyed, but the acetabulum is present. We put the trochanter inside the acetabulum. And this is his remodeling at uh, six months. You can see that, you know, it's not perfect, but they get uh, developed some kind of a pseudoarthrosis pseudo and some kind of a pseudo joint at the hip. And they also sort of, you know, do not dislocate the hip. So the leg does not become significantly shorter as they grow old. So it can be a very useful procedure in a very dire situation. So this is uh, just a paper outlining different ways where uh, trochanteric arthroplasty can be done. This is again, one of our own cases, a forlin 1B where the hip is where it should be, but there is no femoral head. So we did a modified trochanteric arthroplasty and covered it, covered the dysplastic uh, pelvis by doing a DEGA uh, posterior coverage osteotomy of the pelvis. 
Uh, you can see the abductors where the sutures are there. We retie them after we put the trochanter inside the acetabulum. And over a period of time, we develop this kind of a, a pseudoarthrosis at the hip. But uh, so I'm just going to forward this a little bit. You can see it's amazing to see the kind of function that is possible. So, so you can see that uh, quite amazing function is possible in spite well, of a not so good looking x-ray. So osteochondroplasty is another procedure. This procedure can be used for a 1A, 1B or a 2A. Uh, if the capital femoral epiphysis is present, but it is deformed. We have to use advanced imaging or an arthrogram to define the status of the CFE first. We use a modified anterior iliofemoral approach for this. You do a capsulotomy, debridement, and then you reconstruct. And uh, to look at the morphology, a CT MRI can be used, and various types of morphology have been described uh, depending on the shape of the femoral head as outlined. So. Uh, you can basically, the idea is to shave off any additional bone that is restricting motion and try to get as congruent a reduction inside the hip as is possible. So this is a two-year-old child, uh, septic dislocation of the right hip. Uh, when we went in, you can see it's a completely dysplastic femoral head. We did osteochondroplasty. The acetabulum was shallow. It was very unstable after open relocation. So we fixed it for a period with a smooth pin. And then you can see very reasonable function at follow-up. The child has good, good flexion, good abduction of the hip. Uh, we don't know what the fate of these hips will be in the very long term, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is very useful for restoring function in the short term. So for a 2B, this is loss of head. Uh, this is uh, obviously a salvage situation where the head is dislocated. Uh, the hip is dislocated and there is absence of the head. So again, as we uh, talked about trochanteric arthroplasty in young patients who still have a cartilage in the greater trochanter, or in older children who are already fused, we can use the pelvic support osteotomy. So this is a trochanteric arthroplasty, again, one of the examples from a paper. And this has been uh, uh, modified by some authors to split the proximal part of the femur, put one part inside the acetabulum and reattach the abductors to the outer part. So this is called the Albies arthroplasty. So an example of that taken from literature. Uh, the option for a child who is already skeletally mature uh, is a pelvic support osteotomy where the head is absent. So PSO improves abductor moment and minimizes Trellenberg gait. Uh, it provides mechanical support to the pelvis. Uh, it, it is usually not done in skeletally immature uh, children. Uh, it's best utilized in skeletally uh, mature patients because the immature children can remodel all their osteotomies. So here we basically have two osteotomies, the proximal part of the osteotomy is used for the pelvic uh, support proper, as well as when the trochanter comes out, it stretches the gluteus medius and improves the abductor lever arm. The distal osteotomy is used for limb realignment and lengthening of the limb. So there are two osteotomies. Uh, that is what they look at. There is some planning involved. We have to get a ma maximum adduction view and see how much abduction is possible. There is this drop angle view that we can take in ma maximum adduction. Scanograms are very useful. And just some details of how, you know, these views are done. Uh, basically, the idea is the proximal osteotomy lies at the level of the proximal femur that hits the ischium in maximum uh, adduction of the uh, extremity. And then 
we also have to account for an adduction contraction and we aim for an overcorrection of 15 to 25 degrees to account for remodeling, which is very, very common in children. So the distal osteotomy, as I said, realigns the limb axis and is also used for lengthening of the shortened limb. And this is dropped down from the proximal osteotomy to the mechanical axis. So here's an example of a PSO. We used to use monolateral frames like this and do simultaneous proximal and distal osteotomies, but we found uh, we had a lot of complications like pin tract infection in the long run, poor quality of regenerate in the distal osteotomy and knee stiffness. So nowadays we have abandoned doing this with a monolateral frame. We do it in two stages. The first stage is the proximal osteotomy. We use a plate and then after that has healed, we put a ring in the distal femur and do the distal osteotomy for the realignment and lengthening. So here's a case. This was a failed DDH surgery that underwent pelvic support osteotomy, one of our old cases. And she went on to have quite a good result and very reasonable function at seven years uh, follow-up. So hip arthrodesis is another uh, condition where, you know, when the hip and the cartilage has been destroyed by sepsis, but the head is still present and it is sitting inside the acetabulum for a 1A or a forlin 2A, we can consider this. When considering hip arthrodesis, the most important variable is it should be done only for monoarticular disease. This procedure is going to give you a lot of problem if adjacent joints are not normal. So that is the prerequisite for a hip arthrodesis, monoarticular disease. And it is a good procedure we have found in high demand patients. So position of fusion is the most important factor predicting outcome. The table shows various papers and one that we uh, published where you, know, you need a bit of hip flexion and you can have neutral rotation but you should never deduct the hip. You always want a little bit of abduction to facilitate gait. And you prefer external rotation over internal rotation. And again, nowadays with advances in total joint arthroplasty, if we preserve the abductors, you open the door to do an arthroplasty later on. So this is a 15 year old male following tuberculosis of the hip, very arthritic. You can see, uh, uh, examination under anesthesia, I think, is very important because sometimes when you examine clinically in the, in the office or the outpatient, the hip might look like it has already fused. So when you do an EUA, you, found, you find that usually it is just due to pain that they're not moving or there is just a fibrous fusion. So it's imperative to examine and then achieve a bony fusion in these cases. So like I demonstrated, we usually do this prone or in a lateral position. Position is very, very important. You do good reaming of the acetabulum and the femoral head get raw bony surfaces that contact each other. Uh, if uh, there is a little bit of bone loss, you might consider using some bone graft harvested from the posterior iliac crest. And we usually use a cobra plate, but you can use whatever is available in your practice. Uh, and then, like I said, preservation of abductors keeps the bridge open to convert to an arthroplasty later on. And this seems to be a very, very good procedure. We are currently doing a 20-year follow-up on some of our patients, and hopefully we'll be able to publish our results soon. So again, another example of a successful hip fusion. Again, I want to emphasize that this is a very demanding procedure, so preoperative planning should be there. And then... Uh, your indication will define your success. So do, do not ever do a hip arthrodesis for patients who have multiple joint problems. It is reserved for the monoarticular hip arthrosis. And in children whom, in whom uh, the results of total joint arthroplasty are still not well defined, this is a very useful procedure. Here's an example of one of our cases. Uh, at long-term follow-up. They are very, very functional in the villages also and in their surrounding. And uh, they have to modify their sitting and uh, putting lower body garments and footwear to some extent, but otherwise patients are usually very happy. So this is a nine-year follow-up, post-infective left hip, complete resolution of symptoms following arthrodesis. And here we have a difficult situation. This is a post-septic fusion. I mean, we call it post-septic. They present so late 
but if they have no history of trauma, then it's probably due to infection. And usually they have some small scars or sinuses that point to a history of infection. And uh, there was no primary treatment and she had increasing pain and inability to ambulate. So this is a representative case. Uh, so this was probably a combination of infection and uh, trauma that she sustained later. So to pull the hip down, we did this radical hanging hip surgery and tried to pull it down to station. And in the second stage, we went in and fused the hip. We used some bone graft. And you can see that she has reasonable function at uh, two years follow-up. They walk quite well. So for a 2B, when the, when the head is absent and hip is dislocated, can we do a fusion? We don't know, but at HRDC, we have seen some examples from our archives that you, you, know, you can, if you have adequate bone stock, uh, this can be an option also and achievable just to realign the limb and then fuse it to the uh, level of the acetabulum. These are very demanding procedures and not without complications. Uh, this is one of my cases where when I was trying to dislocate the hip to do a hip fusion, I fractured the proximal femur. So it turned into from a difficult operation to a very, very difficult operation. I had to plate the femur and then stack the cobra plate over that. And so, you know, we have to be careful and cautious that we can run into complication and be prepared also to deal with them if they happen. Uh, this is one of... Uh, this is not my case, uh, case that I borrowed. This was successful fusion. Uh, the patient went on to have a total hip arthroplasty on the other hip. And then they were so happy with the result that they demanded a conversion on the hip, uh, hip arthrodesis side. So uh, just to emphasize again that if we preserve the abductors, the option to convert it into an arthroplasty remains open. So... Total joint in a naturally fused hip yields more favorable results as the abductor mechanism is not disturbed iatrogenically, but higher rate of infection in conversion may reflect the natural history of infection. If we contemplate a conversion, we have to keep in mind that if we started with an infection, perhaps that infection can reignite if we put a prosthesis. I don't know, there's not much literature on this, out there to make a conclusion, but we have to keep this in mind when we want to convert uh, one of these arthrodesis into a, a arthroplasty. So in children, there is very little evidence, inconclusive reports on utility of total hips as a primary procedure. There are very, very high revision rates as one would ex uh, expect. And you know, in our situation, the availability and cost constraints for the type of patients we are treating is a major barrier to embark on these kind of uh, procedures. So there, there is some data coming out, coming out now on survivorship of hip and knee implants in pediatric and young adult population. This one was from uh, the American JBJS from uh, Australia, I think. And in this they had, you can see there were uh, total hip in 297 patients less than 20 years and uh, young adults total hip. Uh, you can see the revision rates were 4.6%, not that bad. And total knee in 21 to 30 years, revision rate was 10.3. So again, it uh, this kind of literature says that uh, there is still very little evidence. I mean, especially the age group that we are talking about, these are much, much less than 20 years. And uh, I don't think in with the current kind of data we have and the situation that we practice in, uh, total hip arthroplasty should be chosen as a primary procedure to treat uh, neglected sepsis of the hip joint, but this can change with the advances in arthroplasty in the future. Sometimes we see cases like this. Uh, this is a natural post-septic fusion. The hip, uh, they had sepsis, the hip dislocated, and then it actually achieved a bony fusion in an uh, unacceptable position. So this kind of case you leave the fusion alone and you do a distal realignment osteotomy, or you could do a excisional arthroplasty or a pelvic support osteotomy. Those are our options. So this is one of the cases you can see. Her leg is too adducted for her to be able to ambulate normally. So we went in, we left the fusion alone, and then we ended up doing a realignment osteotomy, and the patient went on to do quite well. 
she is a bit short and this kind of case can be treated later on with a limb lengthening procedure. Uh, you can see follow-ups show quite good realignment of the lower extremity. Now, we are still seeing cases like this at HRDC, and these are unanswered cases. You can see the hip is completely destroyed, but so is the femur and the knee. And there is no answer to this kind of uh, uh, really dire situation. We don't know how to approach this kind of situation. Probably, you know, with the availability of bone banking and allografts, uh, we will be better able to address uh, this kind of uh, a uh, very difficult, challenging situation, but currently, I mean, we just go in and do what we can. Uh, in this particular case, we tried to, we put some titanium nails after uh, debridement and all that. And for the femur, you do sort of a masculine procedure where you can use bone cement and then let a pseudo membrane develop and come back and graft it. For the hip, we didn't do anything. We did an arthrogram. We saw some cartilage that is uh, representative of a uh, uh, you know, round cartilage inside. So we left the hip alone and we just have to wait and see how this hip will remodel. The neck is at risk of fracture. So it's a very, very difficult problem with multiple challenges. And uh, we still have to uh, just wait and see how to kind of create an algorithm to treat this kind of difficult case. So to conclude my talk, first create a problem list. Does the patient have pain, stiffness, deformity, instability, limb length problems or abductor insufficiency, then put them into one of the following classification. Is the head present and reduced? Is the head present and dislocated? Is the head absent, but the hip is reduced? Is the head absent and is it dislocated? Then look at the age of the child and then choose one of these four uh, options. If the head is present and there is no dislocation, these are the options we discussed. We might just observe if the patient is functional, you might do a femoral osteotomy, valgus osteotomy for a neck non-union, varus for a containment of the hip if it's subluxated, pelvic osteotomy if there is dysplasia of the acetabulum, arthrodesis if, it is, if the hip is very painful, total joints we don't know, it might be uh, one for the future. And if the head is uh, all right, but the, it is deformed, you can do an osteochondroplasty uh, to uh, make the head as round as possible. If the head is absent, but there is no dislocation, you can consider doing just an epiphysiodesis or put the cartilage of the greater trochanter inside the acetabulum, uh, greater trochanter arthroplasty. And in the future, again, you know, total joints might take over all this. Uh, always do an arthrogram or a CT or an MRI uh, to see the extent of deformity of the head and then decide on doing uh, osteochondroplasty or if there is subluxation, do a containment varus, varicization of the proximal femur. If the head is present, but it is dislocated, you want to do reduce the head. And then uh, supplement that either with a femoral shortening of varus, DRO, v VDRO. Shortening is very, very important in this. Uh, I want you to note that if you are going to pull the femur more than three centimeters down, you are going to cause a sciatic nerve palsy. So in any case where you contemplate, you need a lot of uh, you know, you, there is a lot of length you need to cover to pull the femur into the acetabulum, always do a shortening procedure. Too tight a reduction is going to either re-dislocate or if it stays inside, it's going to cause AVN and a sciatic nerve palsy. So have a low threshold for shortening the femur. If there is dysplasia, do a pelvic osteotomy. Uh, you know, arthroplasty for late presenting DDH, we know that arthroplasty, you can do an arthroplasty by doing a uh, femoral shortening and using appropriate implants that accommodate antiversion. You might just do a resection arthroplasty. You can pull them down and do an arthrodesis like, like I showed in one of my examples. And if the head is deformed, you can con consider doing osteochondroplasty or containment. And if the head is absent and the hip is dislocated, what is the age of the child? If they are less than six to eight years of age, we can do a greater trochantric arthroplasty, put the cartilage into the trochanter or do the modified albi where we split the proximal femur and put one end inside the acetabulum and re reattach the abductors into the other side uh, on the other end. And if there are more than eight years old, you can do a pelvic support osteotomy or sometimes you might consider uh, total joint arthroplasty if they are 
uh, skeletally mature.